Uh, so, uh, hey everyone. So, uh, let me introduce our uh, speaker today. So, it's uh, Mohamed uh, Alsin. So, he's an assistant professor of the computer science at uh, COST. So, he has uh, become a senior member of this HBE since his 4th, 2021. And also, previously, he was visiting faculty of the Center of Computer Science Department. Uh, I was I was personally met Mohamed uh, when he was a postdoc in FAIR and was interning here. And he has been working on a lot of the uh, research between the R's and AI, and also this between the AI, uh, like VN language stuff. So, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of this, this kind of award and in his bio, so I'll just skip it. Uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, let, and let's make it for more of a talk. So, but, but uh, today Mohamed is going to be talking about uh, imaginative AI towards human level imagination, AI skills trans uh, transforming uh, species, discovery, content creations, and self driving cars, and emotional health, right? So, oh, it's, it's actually involving a lot of cool stuff. So I was really uh, eager to listen what you are going to cover. And yeah, welcome Mohamed. Thank you, Jason, and thanks everybody for being here. I'm really uh, honored to be with you. Uh, today and looking forward to interact with everyone. Feel free to stop me at any point if there is something that that uh, you want to ask about. Um, right, today I actually would like to talk to you about uh, maybe uh, the, the, uh, an, an exciting um, uh, direction that I have been like, passionate about maybe for more than 10 years. And it, it actually mostly informed all of the research that I've been doing in this uh, this years. I'll try to go through some of the like an overview of that and maybe some of these methods will kind of go more uh, in, in depth about them. <laughs> All right. So uh, before I start, I'd like to also credit a lot of the like students and also collaborators that, that have been part of, of this uh, journey. So this is my, my current group. Uh, Ivan recently just uh, graduated, my, my very first PhD student uh, who joined uh, recently Snapchat and the rest of the team who contributed a lot to the work uh, that you may see here. Uh, all right, so we all, all, all of us are familiar about this, the classical view or the classical problem of visual recognition, where we have a fixed vocabulary of objects and want to classify, and we, we, we typically uh, fine tune this neural network with what's typical uh, neural network and classify cats with, uh, uh, by predicting this fixed set of lens and cats are, are given an image of a cat, predict the cat, if it's strong, then we back propagate the error. Uh, same thing for, for dogs and so on. Um, but uh, we may soon then realize that if we think about the world scale, there exists, according to this science paper, um, more than 7.7 .7 animal species in our pla planet. And only one million of those species uh, has been cataloged. So this means what? This means that more than 85% uh, of those species has not yet been discovered. And you can see that the systems are like uh, scientists and behavior ecologists are always looking for uh, understanding the behavior of the current of current species and also discovering new ones. So this is this you can soon realize that having a system with close number of close vocabulary will not be capable of understanding this or if you aim to have AI system that can accelerate our understanding of the planet and maybe realize that hey this is this is species that is uh, so could be so could be visually close to one of the recent species but not close maybe there could be some differences that may justify a case to raise to a behavior ecologist to confirm if this could be a new species or not and since we have uh, like it's very difficult for people to swim underwater or to stay for a long time in forest and things like that this might actually make a difference made the scale to the world scale so this is one of the uh, interesting uh, perspective that 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 can uh, motivate uh, out of domain or or open vocabulary uh, understanding and this is something that could be orthogonal to all these machine learning paradigms so supervised learning, where we have access to all the labels, but still closed and cap. Semi-supervised learning, we can still leverage uh, all this uh, data and, and unsupervised learning. So uh, what I'm, I refer to uh, imaginative AI is my own, I would say, my own connection to these sorts of, of, of problems, of how we train system that can go beyond the, the knowledge that you have seen during training. So uh, I will go through different stations. So how, how can we relate to imaginative AI for seeing, for perception, for creation, for uh, driving? Uh, 
uh, for uh, feeling. So because feeling how people feel towards a visual stimuli is connected not only to, to, to what literally you understand from the image. It's, it's reasoning behind, be, uh, reasoning on top of what you have seen in the image. So for example, if you have a picture uh, like this of a beautiful city with, with a waterfront, you can you can describe what's going on on there, but it, the existing systems might lack an understanding of the emotional the emotions that might be constructed by people can get exposed to this visual stimulus. And you can say, hey, uh, this is a picture of a beautiful waterfront. I can imagine myself uh, sitting by a water, listening to the birds. You're not there yet, right? You there is, you cannot maybe not even be seeing a bird, but you are listening to that because you're. You're relating to this uh, image in a way that that relates mostly to you. So this is this is something that I kind of think is imaginative. Re uh, recognition is basically about recognizing uh, new species or unseen classes. Uh, creation is about uh, how do we train system that can that 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 who we teach it during training to be more capable of exploring the creative space of visual generations. And in, in instead of driving setting, how can we train this system to be more capable of adapting in unseen environment so that it, the, the, the become more safe? Uh, so along the way, we have, um, have worked on introducing some data sets that uh, that uh, that was part of in like facilitating these kind of tasks. So uh, in 2017, we have this paper called Rapid Classifier. Uh, that enables, uh, that was basically a, a paper about zero-shot learning from pure uh, language description. So we augmented this, the COP data set was language descriptions at that time, that's most, more than 10 years ago, uh, augmented uh, this was language description per class. And we wanted to basically facilitate zero-shot learning based on unstructured uh, text. Of course, the problem of zero-shot learning at that time even was not, was not new. Uh, like uh, Farhari and, and Lambert have uh, uh, pioneered this from 2009. The new thing that was proposed in this paper was to enable that by uh, through unstructured text come, that comes from Wikipedia. And uh, I think the paper was cited by like uh, by uh, that uh, opening eye in the clip paper as as maybe one of the earliest paper in this space. Uh, uh, but one one thing that is, you can see that is at the heart of all this is conversionality. Like when you define a new class, you describe it by bus. Small birds have an orange, uh, short orange bill. Uh, bird, uh, the bird this plumage is dark above and white below. These are described. These are visual description that that characterize this particular class that could be unseen by composition of at attributes and how they parse, for example, and how they look like for every single species and the composition of of the of that uh, class may may define uh, if this is a, a seen species or not. <coughs> so one of the things we have also explored recently is to understand or to, to explore compositional understanding in 3D. So we have released a uh, new data set in ECCV called the 3D Compact, Composition of Materials on, on Parts of 3D Things. And it's just also a structured understanding problem where you have access to more than 10 million stylized 3D models. Where you have annotations of the uh, for every one of these models, the object, uh, the the shape category, the uh, annotations, the list of other uh, like part of material pairs that exist in each one of these classes, the texture coordinates, the uh, the materials uh, that, 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 that 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 each part has. For example, this is a uh, like a chair, and the chair legs is made of could be made of metal, could be made of wood, uh, and so on. Um, another composition problem that we have so that was uh, we had a challenge that we ran this CVPR at the Composition 3 Division uh, workshop uh, uh, for the uh, uh, and I think a Google engineer has has won the, the first place. Uh, another data set we have proposed in, in this in the space of composition understanding is this mammal net. It is five uh, data set of five hundred hours of video in collaboration with. Uh, behavior ecologist to the it's a collaboration with MIT Berkeley, uh, Max Planck Institute of Animal Behavior. So we wanted to build a taxonomy like this that is informed by their expertise so that the labeling system makes sense to them. And uh, and the hope is to uh, accelerate monitoring so that the we select like 12 behaviors, for example, that they care about and they may, may inform the research 
in, in some way. <coughs> and the hope is that basically this can continue to, to grow and, and maybe more behaviors are added, uh, more categories are added, uh, so that at some point we, we get to some useful scale that is useful uh, at large. Um, another a set of other data sets we introduced in the, in the, in the space of uh, uh, affection and feeling. Uh, the hope from this set, this series of data set is to uh, enable more research in in building AI systems that are compatible with our emotional being. So we have we have a lot of uh, work that has been done on understanding uh, what literally exists in the image. The hope from this uh, kind of uh, work is to try to have uh, uh, to evaluate emotional reasoning of how people relate to to visual stimuli, but by, 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 by evaluating, for example, how people uh, feel and the, the provided language description is about is, is explaining why they feel that way. So we have this Artemis 1 and CVPR 21 and Artemis 2 is CVPR 2022 and then MLP 2022, we proposed Artilingo, which is basically realizing that different, uh, this was mainly in English, and the uh, Artilingo is proposing to do that on, is collected uh, a, a version of it in Arabic and Chinese in order to understand how people may feel differently uh, to the situation stimuli because maybe <clears throat> based on our background and cultures, uh, the way we relate to images and feel about them can be different. So the data set can itself can be used to, to, uh, um, uh, <clears throat> to, <clears throat> to understand uh, and quantify the cultural agreement and cultural disagreement between people about how they feel towards some visual stimuli and to enable more maybe understanding of culture and cross-cultural psychology. Uh, and I think it may open the question of it, can we model something we might refer to as a culture model. So we, have, we all know about topic models that we can pass the internet and try to cluster, top, cluster things by, by by topics, but uh, cultural model is that maybe if you have access to visual stimuli and how people feel towards it, can you find cluster of 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 of, of uh, responses where, in this cluster, people tend to have similar emotional responses, to visual stimuli, and things like that. Mm -hmm. All right. So this is the an overview. I'm going to go uh, over every one of these stations to shed some light what 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 that actually means. So imagination to, to see, we uh, already discussed this uh, uh, scaling to uh, open vocabulary and, and we need this system that can understand beyond the uh, vocabulary of seen species. And one way to do that is through language description. So if I say, suggest, for example, if, if I describe a class that maybe some of us may not have seen and say that this is a, a a barkeet ochlet uh, is a small bird that have a short uh, orange beak and the bird's plumage is dark above and white below. This description, even if you haven't seen this bird before, you'll start to imagine how it looks like. Uh, and then uh, the identifying that bird among those ones becomes an almost trivial task, right? This shows that we can learn from descriptions and hence we maybe we can build machines that can learn that like us. Um, so this can be useful in 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 uh, like uh, in in conservation setting. Let's say imagine that you have a, a like a, in some situation you uh, are uh, uh, looking at this bird and, and for uh, and out of nowhere it flies away. In other situation you actually have to fly, fly away, otherwise it could be a meal to this hungry bear. From from biodiversity perspective, you care about. Uh, both the bird and, and the pair, and then identifying them at, at the fine grained grain level can be useful to inform decision makers to take some action for those species that could be in the industry. If you have systems that can that can recognize those uh, species and can help people to to identify even if they are not uh, expert, but they can they can be in the loop somehow. This can can scale the the gain of information we know about of what we know about those species and hence we have more accurate decisions so imagine that we have uh, that that kid who have uh, who that that, that 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 have seen the the bird that fly away and then he asks uh, this robot that loves the environment more questions about the bird that he just saw 
that he not he, he didn't take a chance to take a photo of it and then the conversation may continue until the uh paul would suggest hey probably you're talking about this bird so maybe in the first in the first description might not be specific enough to identify the bird but with this feedback we can enable lots more people to help uh like uh, identify more species, gather more information about those species, they have more accurate statistics about existing species, and hence this may inform decision, uh, decision makers to do something. Um, all right, so I have actually was curious to try this with, with ChatGPT and uh, to, to try to see if I describe it to something, we'll be able to identify it. And not surprisingly, it was not capable. As you get deeper in, in knowledge, more specific in knowledge, the model tends to not to be very like uh, satisfying uh, and this i think should uh, may, may suggest that we need to to think more about how we build this technology to be more uh, helpful for uh, expert domains because they do work right this models mostly are trained on the internet which might not be representative of expert knowledge so i think and i think this is only possible if we do cooperate closely with uh, expert domains so that we develop this system so that they can become more assistive to those domains. Like, let's say, these expert domains can be, let's say, behavior ecology. This expert domain can be, uh, for example, uh, uh, let's, let's say, radiology GPT, like maybe use build an assistive technology that help, uh, uh, like, uh, in the, the health uh, care providers to to maybe write the reports better or something, and the, the, the human has to always be involved in my view. Um, so uh, you can see also, you may, may also realize, I know, I know that this is an active topic that is of interest to you as well, like how do we uh, enable the interaction between this language model and and uh, images and and 3D, for example, how do we one day have a robot that you can ask it to pick the cup on the table closest to the coffee machine and go pick you like make you a cup of coffee and bring it back to you or something like that so we are all like i think this is also an exciting domain that is yet to to is that this far from well explored um all right so one of the things that were uh, uh like one of the methods methodology that i've worked on to facilitate tasks like recognition of unseen classes is actually generative and it tried to explicitly model this no notion of imagination <clears throat> so in this case one may think of uh, uh, like a GAN model but you can't think of this as really any generated model so the, imagine that you have a generated model that takes it an input and language description of a class and has some ability to produce visual generations of of the intended class in a way where you may, when you may provide language description of many different classes, here they represent by these five, uh, five clusters, they are well separated, not confused and so on, based on, on how uniquely you described each one of these classes. And may you learn that representation so that these generations are well separated, are less confusing. Uh, zero shot learning task becomes uh, becomes uh, easier easier and easier task because what you needed to do and then for every unseen, unseen class provided their language uh, description you feed it produce some fake generation that representation space and then you have a, an image that you want to classify and then you can do some nearest neighbor classification right so <laughs> this is what i to 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 relate to it and at that time that that was a paper from cvpr 18 and and compared to the state of the art at that time that led to a significant improvement compared to non-generative uh, approaches. And there has been also some parallel work that shows a similar uh, like uh, results, a similar idea. Um, getting to the second station, uh, cre cre creation, how do we teach AI system to learn to imagine beyond the scene? And, and one of our earlier attempts in 2017 uh, was creative adversarial networks, which is a an augmentation on top of GAN models to encourage it explicitly to uh, uh, to explore the creative space or the unseen space of visual generations by by modeling a teaching signal for that. Um, so so the goal is basically given that you have a set of scene classes art in this case it's art classes, Renaissance, abstract art, cubism, and so on. You wanted the model at this time to produce something that's hopefully deviates from what you have seen. Uh, 
And the idea was uh, was inspired by this principle of this effort by Colin Martin, that was a Canadian psychologist, who hypothesized that uh, for human creativity, this was from human perspective, if x axis is novelty and y axis is hedonic value, meaning how people relate, how people like the, the this uh, this human creation, this is uh, this artwork. This is showing that people may not like the work too much if the work is not novel. But as novelty increases, people start may start to like the work more and more. But not for too long. When the work is too novel to understand, uh, such lack of understanding would lead to lack of appreciation. And the point is, how do we uh, model generation so that it hopefully falls into this desired uh, region. One, uh, if we reflect on this, at that time, it was GAN was a very popular uh, generative uh, model. If we think about a, a generative model like GAN, it is trained to produce images that ho are hopefully within the training uh, distribution. So there's no explicit way to encourage it to learn to go beyond set of scene art styles, for example. And uh, uh, so so it may just then, just then generate the Mona Lisa again. It is a beautiful painting, but it is not a creative content anymore. So one of the things that we have done at the time is to do something quite simple. We have a classification uh, loss that given an image, let's say a real image, we, we know existing art style, which are defined here. We can classify during training, which, or if, if it's a given, then it's an image of the sample from the data set, which class it belongs to. And uh, when we train the generator, we train it not only to trick the disk generator to believe that it's real, but to encourage the, the, the encourage the, the encourage it, it to, to be hard to classify to any of the existing R styles as a deviation loss. So more like you are encouraging this distribution to be entropic over seeing classes. And that was one way to model that uh, deviation. And, and relating that to the wanted curve, it's basically, you can think of it as trying to encourage generation to be more like a way as a combination of existing art style rather than creating a new class. And this relates actually to, if you, it's related to this, right? Because you, you, don't, you don't want to make the, encourage generations to be relatable to existing R style. And then if you introduce an, a novel class, say class K plus one, this pushes it more towards this space. And we actually um, quantify, validated that by an experiment, by, by uh, adding this as, as, a, as a, using this loss instead of the high entropy loss. So this is, uh, uh, this is, was it. And this is uh, that, I'm not sure if you can hear, uh, but uh, the sound is not okay. But anyway, so the, this is uh, this. These are some of the creations that was produced by this method at that time. And this actually artwork that you have seen is is a scene from HPO Silicon Valley, and it was this painting was generated and it was bought by by the HPL in the scene. And there was some like you, you some uh, you can you can look it up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Did right. they pay you? Huh? Did they pay you for the art? Uh, yes, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> or something. Nice. Uh, yeah, all right. So fast forward in 2022, we revisited this idea, but by just introducing another uh, loss called Creative Walk Adversary Networks, which tries to model this deviation by uh, like a random walk inspired loss. It is based in, in that time by on, on, on more recent uh, like architecture like style again and you can see here the methods become more capable of producing better paintings and the nearest neighbors to each one of these generations are quite different from from uh, uh, from the uh, from from the generated uh, pieces and I, I probably won't go have a chance to go over the details but the idea is is very simple so you have seen art style this these are seen classes and the red point, the orange points are the whatever the generator produced at the current mini patch. Okay, so you, you wanted to guide the orange points to be less uh, to to be uh, not to be clustered around scene classes as a deviation loss, but you want this to want them want to do that in a message passing way. 
So we construct a, a graph, a random walk graph that connects um, scene class center. These are basically you feed a few examples for every style and then average them. So we have a continuous representation for every class represented by the prototype for every scene class. And then what you do is that you compute a graph where you uh, you compute three transition probability matrices, one from scene class centers to the orange points. So if you are uh, here, what is the probability of you landing on any of these endpoints? So this would be k times n transition probability matrix, right? And then we have another transition probability matrix from n times n from every orange point to every other orange point. And then a third one from uh, which is n times k. This is a transition probability matrix for each one of these orange points back to the scene classes. And what we did is literally like this. So we start from you start from any scene class, you go for t times steps transitioning through the orange points, and then try to classify to compute the landing probability back to any of these scene classes, and you're encouraging this to be entropic. So basically, you want your journey from starting from any scene class going through the generations that you want to be. You know, that you want to deviate from to be hard to to they don't want to make it hard to know which class they started from that's the idea and then we we but you can see that this graph is actually does not introduce new parameters because all, all of them are operating on the representation space so just this loss is just a global loss that make this the, the, the data points uh, message passed to one another so that they collectively deviate from from existing plus uh, and that uh, led we experimentally led to uh, some desired behavior where we produce images that are distance from that training set and people tend to prefer it fair more and also when we evaluated that on in terms of kind of constructed emotion as a way to to quantify meaningfulness of the street artworks and how people relate to it we did this uh, interface so people give people some journey of art, we ask people how do you feel about this and they can pick uh, how they relate to the painting and then they, they here with the ask them to describe why they feel that way and you can see that this is the like histogram of constructed emotions in response to generated artworks um you can see that it can like the, there is a portion of the generations that not are not many in equals 13.3 but you can see most of the time the people can relate with some meaning or some uh, and they can actually describe that the hair for fear for example ghosty figure scar and excitement uh, red interesting peace and anger amusement and so on so you, you can see that there pe people tend to say words that means means that they relate some meaningfully to these generated pieces um yeah, and this are also just some example of con people of generated artworks that people related related to it as contentment and and as fear. Uh, uh, getting back to the loop between perception and creation, you can revisit the same thing that we just described by uh, from generalization perspective. So let's say that the x-axis is how is novelty against thin classes. And here you want to generate visual generate you produce visual generations of an unseen class. If you produce a visual generation of an unseen class that that is that is not distant enough from seeing classes because this is not what against seeing classes, this means that this uh, class might get really confused with this one because both of them are similar. Both of them have orange peak, both of them have blamage that is looks quite similar above and below, right? Uh, so the the this means that the the language description describe these two speeches tend to overlap a lot, right? And we we uh, hence and this makes it very difficult for for the model to produce visual to produce visual generations that is the that distinguish these two classes from one another. And the question is, can we? Uh, can, uh, we wanted to push the generations of unseen classes of of similar of of unseen classes that are very similar to seen ones. So that the are distance from 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 uh, that, ha, that ha, so they have higher novelty compared to C classes, but you don't want to push that too far to 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 uh, to disable transfer from C classes because C classes 
is where you learn what an orange peak is, what the blamage is. Then we did all the past from seeing classes. So we need to be a bit careful. So what, we did something quite simple. We introduced the regularizer, where we explore the semantic space of unseen classes. We call that th. Assume th is 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 a is produced by a function that tries to explore the in the attribute space, the language description space of unseen classes, where where unseen classes could be. Like, think of this as hallucinated description or a, a description of hallucinated unseen class, right? <clears throat> and this can be done in a simpler the way we did it. Actually, was just pick two seen classes and then interpolate between them with an alpha between point one point eight, and then take this hallucinated unseen description. Have a feature representation of it, feed it to generation, and produce visual generations uh, for that hallucinated unseen class. Make that trick the description to believe that it's real. But I want, since this is a, uh, this is hopefully a hallucinated description, yeah. a description of hallucinated unseen class. I want this to be hard to classify to any of the seen classes, so that the model have a better ability to distinguish that from 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 seen classes. And if you do that, the ability of the model to distinguish these two classes from one one is unseen and one seen almost doubles by just adding this regularizer. We the paper it was a paper that I said we nineteen, but we validated that not only in this but maybe seven benchmark and the you can see that uh, from the results that it made a, a difference. Recently, we revisited this in a with the instead of the high entropy with the high entropy loss with this idea of random walk. Remember the one that we talked about in a few slides back? So we revisit the same thing uh, in a more, a little bit more complicated setting where you, you have seen class centers and these are hallucinated generations that are of, uh, these are generation of hallucinated unseen classes and you construct basically the same loss, same run, random walk loss that you used to make the gen visual generations novel. We use the same thing, but here to, to enable the model to be more capable of distinguishing seen classes from seen ones. So we revisit the same loss, non, from, not from generation, generation perspective, but from perception perspective. And uh, yeah, so and this, uh, and it was evaluated in a setting where the classes, the seen classes, the seen and seen class distribution changed over time, it's basically a continual zero shot learning setting. Uh, so you continually see how at the current time step you have set of seen seen classes and then you want to see how your ability to recognize unseen classes uh, future unseen classes improves over time um yeah and yeah this is this has been compared to like uh, like uh, methods from last year cvpr and the results seems to be but we just also introduced some different ways to produce hallucinated unseen classes, one with interpolation, which was formally introduced at ICCV, and one with dictionary based, where we, we learn a dictionary of hallucinated unseen classes that that, that enables, that, that encourages the design behavior. Uh, all right, so uh, getting to uh, 3D, uh, we, we talked about this problem. It is more related to part level understanding of the visual classes. And we have seen a lot of interest in uh, and, and, and uh, the, the technology that enables three visual science has, has become increasingly uh, more accessible. We have seen MetaQuest 3 in Apple Vision Pro. And we have started to see a lot of existing work that, that tries to promote compositions in motions, for example, uh, like this paper, uh, uh, the same paper by Max Max Lincoln Institute was, was, was trying to understand compositions of, of uh, motions like for the 4d motion so sit down and stretch with both arms sit down eat with both hands so it's, it, it it tries to uh it, you have started to see increasingly uh composition in the interplay between language and vision and this whether whether this vision is 2d 3d 4d and so on um and reflections that we proposed uh, this 3d combat data which was ACCV oral. We didn't get a chance to present in person for visa issues, but we we did organize a challenge at CVP this year where we presented the work and also the what we have released so far. This work actually have taken more than two years to build 
um, had started with a conversation with a Silicon Valley startup who works on customizing uh, products so people can go select, I want the, the leg of the chair uh, like to be uh, like wood or metal and so on. And then they, they ask for a call to make this actual chair. And we were, we had this journey of collecting annotation with tried Mechanical Turk and the annotation was totally messed up. So we, we had a we had uh, to redo some uh, some stuff so that we make sure that every part that is that functions the same is named consistently right across all categories and that was that was i get i would say a bit painful to to control but eventually we have this uh, you know, we have a i don't know hundreds of pages of instructions to interacting with the company to to make sure that this is done hopefully in the right way but we are, I'm quite happy about this uh, release. We have a initial release with ECCV, but was 80 terabytes hard to manage. We managed to make it to push this down, uh, optimize the release uh, quite a bit. And uh, the, this is right now under 100 uh, RK. So this is the organ This is the theme of the challenge that this has been organized. The Comma Plus Plus is an improved version that is released for the sake of this uh, uh, 3PR challenge. Um, and uh, you can see that this is how different the data set is from uh, existing uh, data sets at the time. Uh, <coughs> this is the number of stylized models, and this number of stylized models means the number of, of compositions uh, uh, like uh, the geometry as well as the part of material pairs that define the configuration of the current 3D model. Uh, we have 10,000 uh, unique geometry, uh, and you have uh, 42 shape categories, 275 parts, 293 materials. Um, and and for for each one of these four equally spaced views or randomized views, you have uh, part mask, material mask, depth information. You have also the uh, surface normals, uh, if, if that can happen to be useful. We have two hierarchical levels of part annotations, um, fine and coarse, uh, 274 pass for unique uh, uh, pass and 5.21 uh, average pass per model for the fine category and 2.64 course and to clarify to you what that means this is for example the course <coughs> fine category versus the course category for the chair so you can see here there is more uh there's the, this 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 uh, level of pass is more like a uh, higher level compared to the one on the left and this is for for example for for the car so you can see it's only here backrest body car hard car hardware door mirror and here's it's more more fine grain the car, car rear view matter you, ha, you have more more details if you are interested to to do that um this is a pipeline that, that generates this and all, all this is op, open source uh, so we have this geometry we we sample a combination of uh of materials and we have actually an api that makes sure that when you sample a material is compatible with the desired part and this is defined per, per product so we cannot, for example, assign a paper to leg as a material. Um, and you can see this is it, 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 a lot of effort that I won't also credit so much the uh, uh, my student Habib uh, Slim who have did put a lot, a lot of time to make this API accessible in a way that is similar to Coco, Coco API. Uh, so this is how easy you can load the data set uh, and you feed it directly into the training pipeline. So these templates are quite accessible so you can just uh clone the, the 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 repo and then play with it if you're interested uh you can uh, sample and visualize things so these visualization tools are also uh, provided um you can sample point clouds so this is the number of compositions that you want to have per shape number of compositions means number of part material pairs that that defines a new styles so this is the number of styles per very unique geometry and the number of points that you want to sample for the point cloud uh, as well. And there is a detailed documentation uh, uh, that uh, provides uh, this access to how you, you want, how you use this, the, these tools, uh, projections, 2D data loaders, 3D data loaders, uh, and so on. Um, you can actually visualize the pass for, and there is, I think, a web interface where you can actually open some 3D model and, and look at the names of the parts and, and so on. And you can browse through through them if you if, if this is 
interesting. Uh, tasks that can be explored in this is all the standard 3D tasks, 2D, 3D classification, uh, instance segmentation, 3D construction, 3D generation, novel use instances. <coughs> Uh, but we also propose a task that is called grounded compact recognition. It's actually uh, inspired by grounded situation recognition work that was proposed by LNEI. So the evaluation criteria of this uh, of this uh, like task is inspired by by the similar evaluation metrics. And this task is a task of uh, uh, given a 3D model, and you are provided the 3D information. You could be provided also in addition to that some views. The task is to uh, the shape accuracy is the like predicting the shape correctly. If you predict it correctly, if you predict it incorrectly, they get zero score for that example. If you predict it correctly, then you compute the rest of the metrics. So value, for example, is the part the list of part material pairs that has been classified that has been predicted correctly in the current shape. <laughs> and then you put the value is basically the ratio of that. Value all means that uh, you get only a binary score. If you predict all the part material pairs in the current shape correctly, then you get uh, uh, then you get one. Otherwise, you get zero. Value ground it means that you predict them uh, part material pairs correctly, and also it is grounded. And I mean, IU is grounded with overlap with overlap more than 0.5, and so uh, so. This is the, the baseline that we have proposed, and this is the the winning model according to the CDPR uh, like, uh, challenge uh, by Kateri from, from, from Google Perception Team. Um, all right. And then uh, we talked a bit about this MammalNet. It's a data set also we, that was introduced at CDPR. Uh, we hope later to also integrate it with, with, with language and um, it's, it has a 500 hours of vi uh, video, 18,000 videos of animal behavior pairs. During training, you have access to, uh, at this time, you evaluate uh, animal behavior pairs that has not been seen during training, so it has some compositional challenge. Uh, and uh, I think we, in the future, we might or, or we, like we have received some suggestion to run a challenge, or maybe in the next CVPR or something, we might, we might have a challenge in this in this data set. And this work is a uh, collaboration between, um, and it interdisciplinary work between behavior ecologists, represented by Mike Perman and Darren Cooker, who, who work at the Red Sea Research Center at Gauss, then uh, a player called Stillello from the Max Planck Institute of Animal Behavior. Uh, Sarah Bray is from MIT, is, is almost on the border between Vision and uh, you have seen she was a panelist CVPR and Annie Rubrik, uh, uh, who was, uh, was a research scientist at UC Berkeley at the time where this work was done. <coughs> uh, driving is, uh, I'm just sh sharing with you that this idea of deviation can also extend to other scenarios like self driving cars. You're assuming that you have uh, a Z vector that represents a latent class. Uh, for which direction you want to go given the given the history of the current vehicle and surrounding vehicle over the past let's say six times depth or something and you when you are at intersection you your intent defines where you want to go so for example if you are at intersection you can go right straight go left go right first lane go uh, right second lane these are not classes that are labeled but these are classes that are learned from by by descriptive and variables and one thing I think we showed in this paper is that you can actually hallucinate driving latent driving intent and by basically mixing it's kind of a mix up very visiting the idea of mix up but in the scope of motion forecasting where you pick one intent and then at a, at a, at a random time step uh you switch to another one so the the the, the, the reduced trajectory is produced by mixed intent and that will produce a trajectory that you trick the discriminator to believe that it's real. In the meantime, make it hard to classify to any of the existing latent intents. And this reduced the <clears throat> red by evaluation by 50% and the final displacement error by more than 27% compared to the baseline. So this is just to show you some some uh, like uh, reflections on this kind of ideas applied apply to to uh, to motion forecasting that was a paper at ITLA 2021. 
have a bit very likely 2022 about using graph structures for to simplify blank in uh, uh, in uh, uh, in in, in this one, uh, as a, as a you, 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 value memory graph as a world model basically you are trying to learn a representation with a contrastive learning uh, approach a uh, uh, latent space for for uh, for for sub goals basically and sub goals basically you want to you have a task and you want to do you break it down to multiple tasks and you want to find a way to execute this set of tasks together so this uh, this is basically uh, this paper introduces uh, a way to model the to train the representation of the state space, and then you cluster them to define a graph. And then you have another model called action translator that takes the current state, and then I take the next, and then find a, a, a path in that learned graph towards the goal that you want to achieve. And then action, that's actually to take this stick two and the current state, and tries to predict what action you take now. Basically, and this seems this basically tries to add some structure in the learning space to simplify, uh, like uh, the, the the planning. Um, all right, feeling I would say I, I have already almost covered that. Like, by this, we introduced this uh, this uh, data set. I'm just adding, I will just maybe cover in a bit more depth the last paper at MNLP. Uh, so basically, this this is basically collecting how people feel towards an image and and uh, and description of how you feel this way and it tries to do that in multiple cultures so the english version was uh, the english version was collected mainly in north america was mainly amazon mechanical turk the chinese version was collected by baidu in, and people in beijing the arabic version was collected by mostly egyptian universities and and students also at Kaust. <coughs> so we wanted to make sure that every culture speaks for itself um, so we can also see something that seems quite intuitive like uh, this is for example this image how uh, how uh, each like uh, culture uh, i don't i do i do think that culture is more complicated but let's summarize that each language is a culture it's, it's more complicated than that uh, but you can see that many people relate more positively to dry weather because it's more common in, in the middle east but it's not it's not as uh, like it's not uh, perceived similarly in let's say Chinese and English speaking cultures. Um, it's uh, so they did they, they said complete if comparison to Coco, for example, Artemis is 0.45 million annotations on top of 80,000 images. And uh, Artilingo have a is stands for Arabic, uh, Chinese, and English. And the number of annotations per image 15.2, and also collected as another small set on Spanish. We call this for few shot transfer, something like that. And you can also study something like models that can take an image, yeah, a multicultural image uh, captioning system. And if you have this, uh, just a transformer head that predicts the emotions from uh, language description, you can see that there is uh, this cultural agreement becomes more obvious and the model started to pick them up. For example, when you have uh, some image that talks about babies and things like that, you can see that there is more cultural agreement. But for example, when they, let's say a picture that, that has a religious content, uh, in this case, it's, it's about Jesus uh, uh, cross, uh, a beautiful girl holding Jesus cross, uh, stomping on a devil. You can see that in, in English and Arabic speaking culture is more in, in O. Uh, because the culture tend to be more religious, religious, and for Chinese it tend to be more devil because maybe the the there's a little more uh, fear because maybe there's more emphasis on the devil. So we, this might suggest that um, our cultural background might suggest how where we where, what we attend to uh, and inform our our emotions. Data sets and code is available. If we may reflect on that into what Meta has suggested in previous game, the no culture left behind. Uh, like uh, domain, we might want to have vision language models are also more representative of as many cultures. We have made some steps on using few languages in Arabic, English, and Chinese. But if we want to imagine ourselves more representative for many languages, many people, we want to find a smart idea, a smart way to to do this. And maybe we might want to leverage language model that has been trained to speak about many different languages and finding an efficient way to, to hook it to vision uh, tasks. Uh, yeah, one way we approached that was a paper from uh, 
Okay, so uh, I just want to clarify how much time do I? Uh, okay, uh, ten, minutes. ten minutes. I think this is more than enough. Okay, <laughs> so we have this paper that we put, put on archive like more than actually several months before um, Flamingo. Uh, it it has similar like uh, idea. So the idea is to uh, this paper was appeared at CVPR last uh, uh, year, and the idea is to try to leverage pre-trained FGBT2 uh, to enable image captioning, efficient image captioning. So you have a model that, is, that knows how to speak very well, but it doesn't, that it's not learned, it's not trained to speak about language images. So we fix it most of these weights over here, and then we uh, embed the images that we have like a top-down, bottom-up representation of the image. We feed that through a transformer, and we try to let the pre-trained model to attend to this vision representation by, by embedding it in the same space that the GPT-2 can understand. And that led to, uh, by some gating mechanism. Uh, there was some gating function that we introduced, but that to, that was, seems to be helpful. But that's the, the critical part is how do we let those, uh, uh, how do we make the language model, a written language model, model uh, vision informed? And, it, and if you have a data efficiency problem, this seems to be working quite well. So if you train on 0.1% training data, this means that the model is trained only 0.1% of the COCO image text pairs. And it seems to be quite helpful to, to for, for, for efficient captioning uh, methods. And this is for X-ray uh, medical report generation. Uh, tasks to, to the results tend to be quite uh, just quite significant uh, improvement compared to the state of the art at that uh, time. Uh, yeah, so we can imagine if we have systems like 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 this or or similar that can learn efficiently from few examples. This becomes really like critical if you want to scale to too many languages because naturally we cannot collect unless if you if we have oh, hundreds of languages. Uh, that we want them all to support. Some of these language, it's very hard to collect some of these data, so it becomes more important to to find models that can learn from you image text pairs. Uh, all right, and uh, now getting to many GPT like uh, four. Uh, this uh, uh, this work uh, was led by Diao uh, uh, Diao Zhu and uh, John Chen, who are currently actually. Uh, uh, aiming to graduate by the end of uh, this uh, year. Uh, this work is uh, uh, is motivated by the actually the announcement of GPT-4 by Open uh, Open AI, and uh, everybody was like, it, uh, fine. I was curious about how does it actually work? How can we uh, how can we build a system that looks like that? Because if you look at the, uh, I have seen this demo where the. The, the you can write just a joke website and then the model then to take it and then produce the HTML of the website. Oh, this is a very popular example. But if you um, if you look at the technical report, it was almost hard to learn anything useful out of it. Um, so the, no further details are are, are proposed. So the, this uh, this was quite. Uh, uh, made us quite curious to try to explore uh, how can we do something that is open source in, in this space and uh, what are the secrets of this vision language capabilities and uh, is it uh, is it fancy large data sets what type of architecture this all, all these are questions that that was quite uh, intriguing to ask and we're not sure how to do it um, <clears throat> before mini gpt4 we did this paper called chat captioner that was based on clip 2 to produce really rich language descriptions. Chat captioner, uh, chat captioner uh, model is basically a conversation between chat GPT and Plip2. Still, this relies on chat GPT that we don't have access to. Uh, but we found that if we go for 10 turns where chat GPT asks questions about an image uh, and you go on for 10 turns and then ask chat GPT to summarize this, this tend to produce in, in this paper a detailed language description. So, and this these terms are aimed to are aimed to extract more information about the image one turn at a time. We realized that the the the, the, the generated language description tend to be preferred most of the time compared to the ground truths. And this showed us that uh, they, this informing to us that clip to actually uh, is a good information extraction 
it has the representation that is powerful enough to extract to really useful visual knowledge. So, and we extended that also later for, for video, uh, but in, in a similar way, but the video is basically adding more uh, more information in the, uh, I think more temporal information. Uh, they, this inspired us to use Blip2 as a visual platform. And we saw, said, oh, since this is this visual backbone is trained to map between text and images in, in and has hopefully had the information, maybe if we hook it up to pre trained language, language model, that would enable this model to work well and extract the, all the useful knowledge at once instead of having these multiple turns. So it, we did that, and it turns out to be quite well. But there are some technical details that were critical to achieve the best performance. We did the training into two stages. Stage number one is we sampled image text pairs from Lion, CC, and SPU, and we used that to train just a mere layer, uh, which is this. And uh, that was was just trained in 10 hours in four A100 GPUs. And but we, when we tried that, it didn't work well. It tend to produce only single captions because maybe there's a bias on the data set itself because the image text pairs in Lion does not learn to train to, to produce enough details right so we found it critical to have a second pre-training stage where we did some uh prompt we, we we generated we asked the model uh to generate detailed description about the image and then we filtered out all the bad examples so we ended up from five 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 thousand to 3500 and all of these are del detailed and uh, we we have this description, and then we polished it by removing repetitions by GPT-4. So we ended up at the end with uh, and a lot of manual looking into this, but only 3,500 3, instructions like uh, text, uh, like image prompt, and detailed description that we think is high quality. And then this fine tuning stage really made all the like was despite it took only six seven minutes to. To train, it was it, it helped a lot in making the model behave as as it as, as good as as it uh, now. So this training stage take only uh, seven minutes, and it got it from this behavior to to generating poems about images. For example, the sunsets on a, the the man sits on a hill of a rocky city. The sun sets in a place of orange and gold and gold. And, and I tried it in some other random images. Seems to be working quite uh, fine. Describe, it can describe images in details. It can it can ask uh, what is funny about this uh, image, like and why why it relates to like Monday. Today's Monday. <laughs> uh, and uh, we produced opening eye whoops uh, demo. Um, uh, ask it to generate advertisement. So we can already ask it for a unique, uh, stylish sliding solution for your common office. Talk no further, and uh, so on. Uh, describe asking the model to solve uh, problems. Hey, this is an issue. What do you suggest me to do? Um, and another, another, other things that we also uh, there are more examples in the website. But another, another example, we can take a picture of, let's say, your food, and then it, you can generate uh, like uh, recipes and so on. Uh, so, yeah. So this is. So this the code the code is 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 available and it, turns, it, it seems that it gained uh, uh, some attention from the community. Uh, all right. So one of, one of the things that, I, that came to my attention recently is that there's a paper that just posted like last week on Git uh, on on Git uh, on on archive that tries to study and evaluate more many language and language uh, models, including. Uh, including Blip, Instruct Blip and, and many others, and evaluated in two perspective, qualitative capability of evaluation, like visual reasoning and uh, uh, basically existing tasks that uh, that where some of these models are, there's attention to construct instructions to make it work better. And it seems that the from this perspective, you can see that maybe MiniGBT is not uh, performing well, some other models, maybe Instruct Blip uh, uh, by Salesforce is performing uh, 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 much better, and but in if in open domain evaluation, uh, uh, but I think the question is whether this is come coming is is basically the trade-off. Like when you have put more attention to gather data and instruction that 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 
enables this model to do better. So this will inform how we collect the data, and hence it is expected that you can do much better if you if you collect the data and design the, uh, the that to work in to work well. Uh, the this paper proposed ELO score for evaluation is similar to the it's basically inspired by chat post uh, chatbot arena that was proposed by uh, a collaboration between Berkeley, UCSD, and CMU, which is uh, uh, an evaluation based on bearing two large language models in an open domain in a way you ask them some questions and then you get a response from language model one, language model two, and then a human will pick what, which one they prefer. And the model that wins gets more points. Uh, so there has been this has been proposed been proposed on 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 only language tasks. So this paper from from uh, Peking University University of Hong Kong proposed to do some to do something similar, but for vision language model. And you can see that there is some challenges between how do you actually do well in domain where you put intention to cause the data to do in, in certain to do well in certain things you care about, and in uh, out of domain like when you maybe it seems a simple model where that doesn't heavily tune the model. Uh, uh, well, uh, a lot uh, tend to generalize better in open domain questions, and this might suggest that we might want to be careful about how do we uh, balance between in domain and out of domain performance. Um, yeah, and I also like how this can be extended to 3D um, and uh, and video generation. Uh, this is uh, this is just a side paper that, that tries to to suggest or propose. Uh, a motion segmentation approach for video generation where we produce the latent code that control different parts of the video that you want to generate. And I think uh, connecting that to vision from, from language size is interesting. These are the set of references. And uh, thank you for listening. And thank you. Thank you. Do I have any questions or? It's already it's like what? Yeah, sorry for that. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting. So I have a oh, super quick question. You mentioned about this uh, R stuff, right? So uh, do you think it's just that the R things or feeling things can be a evaluation on some of this recent, you know, this mini GPT for? Have you tried that actually? For example, to give me an image and ask mini GPT for to express its feeling and see how it's correlated with the uh, with human response. This is a good question. We we just submitted a paper to MNLP in, okay. uh, uh, trying to focus. I would say only on on this skill and and try to make uh, try to make a start. But let's say with some massively massive multilingual model mm -hmm. and try to train it on seen languages and see if that can generalize on some unseen languages. Um, but not. I, I think it, it can. Yeah, I think your point is that this can be uh, done in a holistic framework where you evaluate many tasks, and 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 uh, this emotion is one skill, one, one skill of them. I think this is this is interesting to explore. We haven't done that, but we we have we have explored really the the emotion part. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe we can. And also, Mohammed was uh, here till one a.m. So if anyone wants to yeah. chat. Uh, At 1 p.m. Yeah. 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 So I on the channel. We can hear. Okay. Yeah. Really.